Welcome to the CAA 2020 Explore webinar series. Today we present mental health and well-being with Dr. Elizabeth Berryman. Thanks so much for joining us and enjoy. Hi, my name is David Waters and I'm the Chief Executive of the Council of Our Mental Authorities. Welcome to the latest in our webinar series. Today we're looking at the really important issue of mental health and wellness in the staff of ambulance services. I have great pleasure in bringing to you today an excellent speaker who we're working closely with. Uh, Dr. Elizabeth Berryman um, is responsible for introducing a mental health and wellness app that we are now rolling out across ambulance services, starting in New Zealand and soon to be in Australia. This is, really import this is a really important piece of work. It fits really well with our mental health strategy. Um, CAA has been working with Ambulance Services now for four years in putting a mental health and wellness strategy in place. And we're really keen to see this latest uh, initiative that will help support the program. I'm gonna hand over to uh, Moitzer, our general manager, just to talk a little bit about the CAA strategy. And then we'll move across to hear from Liz Berryman about the app. The app's called Channel. Um, it's uh, going to change the way uh, paramedics and ambulance service staff can um, keep a track of their mental health and wellness and uh, allow our organisations to respond to changes in that. So I'd like to hand over to Moitza now and uh, we'll see Liz in just a short while. Thanks. Thank you, David. Um, and welcome everyone to this, uh, what we think really exciting webinar on mental health and well-being. And we're very happy to have Dr. Liz Berryman join us today to talk about a bit more on sort of her experience, her story, but also what drove her to create this uh, great app that uh, CIA has uh, engaged to look after our uh, people's mental health and well-being. But before we jump to Liz, I wanted to sort of share with you a little bit about the work that CIA has been doing in this space. Um, mental health and well-being has been a really important topic for us for the longest time and CIA has been really happy to be able uh, to be involved with our services on looking after our uh, people's mental health and well-being and how can we really you know, assess where we are at, what has been getting done in the past years, but also how can we do even better? Um, so about four years ago, um, the services, the CAA and the unions got together in a piece of work that is now the CAA Mental Health and Wellbeing Strategy, which is about it's a, a one of a kind and probably first of its kind where we all got together and agreed this is a very, very important topic and we really need to work on this together. Um, we know that we've got services that have had programs in employee, uh, employees uh, uh, support systems and mental health and well-being programs for the longest times. So you're talking, you know, about 30 years back, some of them go uh, as far back as that, um, which is wonderful, but we do also know that there are services that might not have resources to, to have that, but also we know through CAA, uh, the power of sharing the knowledge and the power of sharing experiences. And this is where I guess the strategy is really tapping into. So a couple of steps and a couple of sort of main features in the strategy, first off really to promote the mental health and well-being through raising awareness. So uh, it's about promoting a positive mental health uh, workforce uh, and workplace. And uh, it's about reducing the stigma around mental health. And we're doing that through talking about it quite openly uh, to featuring mental health and well-being on CIA congresses and other conferences, major summits that uh, services hold, but also having mental health champions like some of our CEOs, some of our top level executives that are very openly talking about their struggles maybe and in how they deal with the challenges of being in these really, really tough positions. Because we know and we always say, we know this job is not easy. We know that what our paramedics see day in, day out is definitely not easy, but 
that shouldn't be a cop out. That shouldn't be, oh, it's part of the job and then you do, don't do anything. So it's very much about us going, that's the job. Now, how do we look after our staff? How do we look after their mental health and well being? And that's where the strategy comes in. Um, it looks to develop capacity for our staff to, to tap into all these resources. So there's a lot of programs that are out there, everything from chaplaincies to peer support programs to, uh, you know, a lot of services now have nowadays have uh, in house psychologists. There's this brand new tool that we're launching now. So the channel app. Uh, which will be designed really to be a daily check-in for our people's uh, mental health being and well-being, mental health and well-being, apologies, um, but also sort of a two-way communication between services and, uh, and staff to be able to share what's bugging them, for us to be able to see what are the trends so we can then react to that and maybe prepare classes, do education, prepare uh, uh, webinars, again, seek to the wider industry to see what is already out there and what best practices we can share. And I guess that's the last part of the strategy is very much about sharing the knowledge and exchanging best practice practices, um, not only between our services, but also we look very much to the external uh, stakeholders and external partners like Beyond Blue, uh, Raw Mind Coach and uh, uh, stuff like that. So we can really go, how can we do even better for our staff? Um, the strategy has been incredibly well received uh, from across the industry, uh, but also um, in other industries. So we've got, uh, we had a lot of interest from our uh, partner services in uh, other emergency sectors, but also overseas. So since the strategy has been adopted and um, our uh, experts and uh, specialists have been out and about and sharing about the strategy and their programs in international conferences, we have now had our UK colleagues and our Canadian colleagues uh, take up the strategy as well, which is really great. We know Australia and New Zealand is doing some incredible work and some incredible groundbreaking work in this space. So it's lovely to see that um, the rest of the world is uh, picking up and, and I guess sharing our knowledge. So another thing that we've done um, to, to sort of go in line with the strategy is we've set up a CIA mental health and well-being working group, uh, which has been meeting now for the last four years. They meet uh, twice a year preferably in person, uh, not this year, obviously, because of COVID, but we try and get everyone in the room together because we we notice that's the best way when we are sharing uh, um, experience and knowledge, but also networking. And that group has been absolutely incredible. And the amount of synergy and the amount of knowledge sharing uh, has been incredible to see. Um, so yeah, they're very much there really to, to, to work on uh, how do we deliver the strategy? How do we deliver the 10 steps of the strategy? And how do we do better every year, do a little bit more and a little bit more? So later in the year, we're actually putting together a document with best practices uh, under each of the steps. So we've uh, done a bit of a review where we sort of started off four years ago and where we are now. And what uh, that really gave us was a whole bunch of information on these beautiful programs that we wanted to share. So uh, we'll have that hopefully ready by the end of the year, probably launching it in the new year. So that's in a nutshell what I guess the CIA mental health and well-being strategy is about, but also sort of the work that we have been doing in this space. Um, I'm very excited for you to hear more about our new app channel and how that actually fits in. So you will see it actually covers quite a few spots uh, throughout the strategy, everything from promoting uh, mental health and well-being uh, to reducing the stigma, uh, being to, able to collect data, so which is what the services will be able to do, having that two-way communication between staff and the managers and the services really, so we can really react on what is happening in the industry and what is happening with our workforce and sort of putting those uh, better programs but also evolved programs as we know sort of every year things change so just this year obviously COVID threw a whole big curveball down uh, uh, our way and our uh, mental health and well-being group uh, has been busier than ever trying to really look after 
the staff, their family, their kids, the, the, our, our managers and how they support their staff. So like I said, every year things uh, change a little bit and we're here and the strategy is here to really react to that and um, always look on how we can do even better. So enjoy the uh, speech by uh, Liz Berryman. Um, and at the end, uh, I know um, David and Liz uh, will have a bit of a Q&A so you can ask questions. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for your time and look forward to then seeing you back for our next webinar next month. Thank you so much. Bye. And now let's hear from Dr. Elizabeth Berryman. We all became health professionals because we want to help those in need. We all have a deep desire to care and assist for those in physical and emotional distress. Whether it be jumping out of helicopters, attending accidents, or holding the hand of an elderly lady as we take her to hospital for the third time this week. We all get a kick out of caring, but who cares for the carers? Who is there to make sure that we're okay? Kia ora, tēnā koutou katoa. My name is Dr. Elizabeth Berryman, and today I'm going to share with you a piece of my story about how this changed my life and how you can be involved as well. You see, when I was eight years old, I dreamed of being a doctor, but I took the scenic route and actually started nursing school at AUT. I was the grand age of 17 and I was a qualified nurse at just 19. I started working at North Shore Hospital's Emergency Care Centre, and then I went on and worked in the outback, then I came home and worked in Māori health in a whānau auto setting, and then I even trained to be a nurse practitioner. Finally, I followed my dream to be a doctor. I applied to five different medical schools, and I was finally accepted into the Otago Medical School in Dunedin. And this is where my story begins. You see, I was a fourth year medical student, and I was so excited to be getting out of the lecture theatres and onto the wards for the first time. However, it wasn't to be the exciting experience that I hoped it to be. In fact, I was placed in a toxic workplace environment, one where there was a bully who set the tone for the entire ward. He was a senior surgeon and for some reason he just decided that he had it in for me, um, that I was gonna be the target of his bullying. Now, at this time, I didn't actually realize that I was being bullied. I thought I was incompetent, I thought that I wasn't good enough, and this started to erode my mental health. For the first time in my life, I started having panic attacks. I would completely shut down even thinking about having to go to the ward. I also began not being able to sleep. I wasn't eating properly. And all my friends around me noticed that I was starting to withdraw from going to social events. I felt that I just wasn't cut out to be a surgeon or a doctor. So it got so bad that even just after four weeks, I went to see the Dean of the Medical School and I said, look, I quit. I'm going to go back and be a nurse. This is when he said to me, actually, no, Liz, this particular person is a known bully. You're just going to have to toughen up and become more resilient. Now, when he said that to me, I was like, actually, I'm a pretty resilient person. Thank you very much. I've done outback nursing and ED nursing. I, I know what it's like to face trauma and to be in intense work environments. But this was something quite different. And I said to him, I said, look, I'd actually like to understand what's going on here are we able to do some research around it? And he said, yes, that's a great idea. But first things first, I went to the student counseling center and I got myself some help. I went and I actually went through two different counselors before I found a counselor that I really connected with. She was fantastic. And so I was able to start to process some of the things that had gone on for me in that placement. Then I went to the New Zealand Medical Students Association and together we did a survey, a national survey of all medical students in New Zealand. And we found that in fact, I wasn't alone in my situation, that 54% of people had also experienced bullying or harassment whilst on the wards. Now, if you go back to that previous slide, you'll see that in fact, I actually ended up becoming a bit of an advocate around this. This is me on the six o'clock news and it was really, really scary actually, speaking out for the first time around being bullied and my mental health. And I felt that, you know, it was quite difficult. A lot of the senior doctors were saying, you know, you just need to toughen up. This is part of being a doctor. What are you students going on about? But then there was a groundswell of change. And all of a sudden, people started to realize that this actually wasn't okay in this day and age. And we needed to do something around our toxic and workplace environments. 
So you'll see there, there's, a, there's a emblems, so the Royal College of Surgeons, they started a whole campaign around let's operate with respect. And that was because they did their own survey, which found that in fact, 60% of their trainees had experienced bullying or sexual harassment whilst in training. And you know, this is a problem that's not just in healthcare, it's endemic everywhere. You'd be hard pressed to open a newspaper these days and not read a story about sexual harassment or bullying. And now there's been a surge of change coming. And it's really exciting to see that we can actually make a difference in this place. So what else did we do? The next thing we did was we started to do more research about what goes on for people in the workplace. And we found that actually staff well-being and burnout had a huge effect on patient safety. In fact, a few articles go to say that 88.9% uh, had a substantial negative impact on patient safety. Um, the next slide shows here around the impact on work. There was a recent Canadian study that showed the differences between poor mental health and poor physical health on workplace productivity. And you'll see here that mental health had an 82% effect on productivity, whereas physical health only 53%. And yet we focus all of our health and safety on just keeping us physically safe and we ignore the psychological safety element that we need as well. So we got together a research team. We've got some pretty high powered professionals from the Otago University and Auckland University. We've got the Dean of the Christchurch Medical School, Professor Tim Wilkinson. We had uh, the head of the Bioethics Centre, uh, Lindley Anderson and uh, Emma Collins from the nursing school. And we've also got some other um, amazing researchers that work with us on it. And we uh, went out to people to say, hey, what would you like to help with your mental health? And it was really interesting. So part of these focus groups, people told us that they wanted a safe and an anonymous place to be able to talk about what was going on for them. Because we know that there's a whole lot of systemic issues that go on that affect our mental health, just as much as what day to day uh, happens to us um, in our jobs. I hear time and time again from paramedics that it's actually not going to the big traumas or uh, going to those uh, particularly difficult clinical situations that erodes our mental health. But in fact, it's the other things. It's the workload pressures. It's, the, it, it's, it's being audited. It's, it's feeling like um, there's too many pressures from all sides, from all different places. The trauma from past events do, does do build up and we still need to address that. But actually, the other systemic issues also need to be addressed at the same time. Through the focus groups, people said that they wanted to be able to wait to have to measure how they're going. Because sometimes when you're a busy professional, it's hard to know actually if you're doing okay or if you actually really do need to go and get help. So they said that they wanted an app. And I said, no, you don't want an app. There's you know, a thousand wellbeing apps out there. And they said, no, we really want an app. So the first thing that we did with our clinical studies was we designed a really basic app uh, and we got medical students and nurses and doctors in Middlemore Hospital to use the app to see how it went. And lo and behold, people used it. And um, part of the app was a daily check-in. So it just would ping people and say, hey, how was your day today? We would ask a series of five questions, which was sensitive for detecting anxiety and depression up to 90%. And the next thing we did was we said, what happened to you today? What did you experience? And so we had some things that were full, filled in there around I participated in a sport or hobby or I worked well in a team today. And then we also had some of those negative things that could happen, like uh, I felt like I wasn't appreciated as part of the team or I actually felt bullied or sexually harassed. Then it goes into um, an algorithm and it splits it up and it says, actually, this is how you're tracking. You're doing great. Uh, here's some ways that you can stay well. Uh, and then also if you are trending low, so if you keep getting low for, the, for say two weeks or more, it'll pop up and it'll say, hey, it looks like you're uh, in a rough patch at the moment. We can, you know, we suggest that you take some action. So it allows people to be able to monitor and get self-help. We know when it comes to uh, mental health, it's about those early recognition of signs and early intervention. So if we can do those two things through the app, we know that we're really going to be starting to help people to manage their own mental health. So here on the slide, you'll see that um, indeed, it's an anonymous journaling and data uh, gathering app. It enables people to keep track of their personal well-being and to manage and monitor their own mental health risk factors. As I said, it's 90% accurate in detecting detection of clinical depression. 
Uh, and there's also that resource library that I talked about that would enable you to get support when you need it. Because, you know, it's usually two o'clock in the morning, you know, when you're on a night shift and not on a Saturday or a Sunday night when there's no managers around, well, you actually need to get that support or you've got time to get that support. So um, having it in an app that's on your personal smartphone is a really, really good way to be able to access that. And so here it is, just some screenshots of that app. Uh, it's really simple. It just says, hey, where are you working? Uh, those five questions, and then what have you experienced today? If there's nothing in that list of experiences, then you can go into the journal. Now, this is where you can just really say things how they really are. We want to know about everything. So we know that we take our whole selves to work. And, um, you know, just because um, you're, you know, loving your work and you might have a great time at work, you might have some other stuff going on at home you are able to journal this here as well, because you know, even though we try not to let it affect our work life, sometimes it does, and it's important that we address uh, issues as a whole person. So you can choose to keep that journal private, or you can choose to share it with your organization. If you do choose to share it, what happens is, is it becomes anonymized, it goes into an aggregated amount, so there's a minimum of 20 people per group, uh, so there's no way that people can figure out where those journal entries have come from. The other thing that channel does is that if, if it's identifiable in any way, uh, we reject it and we always send through as the themes to the organization. But it's also important that they hear your voice. So we leave things in verbatim text as well. So if you use swear words and things like that, we'll leave that in and your organization will be able to see that. So on this slide is Boosters. So Boosters is basically a well-being hub of everything that you can have to improve your well-being. So it's things like links to EAP. It's links to things that your organization is doing to improve your well-being. It's things for associations. So for instance, CAA, uh, things like that uh, we can go into the booster and that is a one-stop shop so that you can go, actually, I'm not doing so well with my well-being. What can I do to improve it? Let's have a look and go into boosters. What can the organization see? So as I said, it's all 100% anonymous. Channel is a safe third party provider and that's what the research and the clinical studies that we did that came through time and time again is the nurses and the doctors, they said that they really, really wanted to have a safe channel. So what happens is, is this comes through an aggregated um, graphs and this is how an organization can see what's going on. The other thing is, is that users wanted to see how they were tracking themselves. And um, it's really important that you can actually take action yourself. So uh, having a weekly report in your, in your app will show you how you're trending. Um, and also there's, there's a few things that we do to make sure that you um, actually enjoy checking in with yourself. And things like um, if you do seven days in a row, then it gives you a little, um, <laughs> a, a little reminder that, yeah, you've done seven, seven days in a row. And um, we're actually going to be working with a few organizations around how we can um, actually give you guys something back for monitoring your mental health. So another thing that came up time and time again when we do our research studies is that uh, people really wanted to be able to speak up about what was happening. We have a whole lot of rhetoric about when you see bullying, you should stand up, don't be a bystander, be an upstander. But actually, when you're in that moment, in that point in time, like you guys would know, it's like when you're in the middle of a recess, it's not the time to be like, hey, can you stop yelling at me, please? Like, you know, it's not really appropriate. But later on, it's actually like, in that recess, we didn't need to be yelling. Like there's members of the public around, it's not a professional look. And it didn't make me work any faster or better, but I need to speak up about that. So this is a place where you can start to actually journal some of your own thoughts about that. You can just take a record and then you might even be able to be an upstander later. So the Speak Up portal um, can it be actually shared with your organization as well, because you know if this is a reoccurring thing happening across all of the ambulance providers that say, you know, communication during a recess is, is something that needs to be addressed, then we can do specific training and support just around that. We also have a chat bot. So, you know, as I was saying, at two o'clock in the morning, uh, our users were saying that that's when they wanted to talk to someone. And you can't just, you know, get a counselor on the phone at two o'clock in the morning. But with, through technology, we can get a chat bot. So we've got an amazing chatbot in development at the moment, and it's really exciting that it's gonna be able to be the first ever chatbot for psychologically counseling, I think, in the world. So it's a world first. And so this is something that's really exciting that we're gonna be coming through with. Um, 
and part of this chatbot is actually going to be helping you to triage actually is this urgent do i need to see someone tomorrow about this or can i take some self-help tools and, and and see somebody in a week or so um the other thing is is it's going to help you be able to prioritize things so you know particular issues around say ptsd or around alcohol and drug use things like that so you can go and see the right counselor um a lot of times when you go to eap you don't really know who you're going to get so in this way, by using the chatbot, you can be able to see the right person at the right time, and it just saves everybody's time and effort. So considering we've come a long way from our research and now into um, developing this for healthcare organizations, um, during COVID-19, we've just really taken off. Mental health for all healthcare workers is really, really a priority right now. And it's exciting, finally, people are listening to us and realizing that we need to support our mental health. And so we've been working with a whole lot of um, companies across New Zealand. And as you can see, most of them are uh, healthcare providers with five hospitals. But there's also Tourism Holdings Limited and Z Energy, which are large uh, providers in New Zealand of tourism and of fuel. So that's really interesting. And as you can see, um, through CAA, we're working with St. John Western Australia, Ambulance Tasmania, South Australia Health, and also Wellington Free and St. John New Zealand. We're really excited uh, to be able to work with you guys on this. And um, so just in closing, a little bit of a case study from Middlemore Hospital, who's using the app. So one of the junior doctors said that um, they were able to report things that they weren't able to report otherwise. They felt safe to be able to talk about things. Uh, one of the new graduate nurses said that she had an idea for how a way to improve handover between ED and the wards, and the manager brought it up in a meeting. She said that she was chuffed because she'd always been too scared to speak up in group meetings, but finally her ideas were being heard. So. How can you be involved? Well, as I alluded to earlier, the CAA had partnered with Channel and we're really, really excited about this partnership. The team at CAA are really, really passionate about mental wellbeing and realize that this is a massive issue for all paramedics and frontline medical staff. So part of that, what they're able to do is they're able to keep the ambulance services a bit more accountable around this information. So they are going to take on the data that comes through from the channel app, and they're gonna be able to process that. They've got a data person who's ready to, to work with this data and to find out what are the key themes and drivers for people's wellbeing. And then they're able to design uh, support packages and interventions to support that. And they're able to can go and say to the member organizations that, people that you work for and say, look, these are the top things that we want to change this year. Because we know that things are gonna take a while to change, but we've gotta make a start. And it's, good to, it's a good place to start is to get the right data, to get your input and to get your feedback into what you want in your workplace. The other thing is, is that it's gonna really, really help your personal mental health. If you're able to track and monitor how you're going and to get help through, say, the chatbot at two o'clock in the morning, it's gonna, to help reduce some of that burden of mental health that we have in our ambulance providers and in our frontline healthcare workers. So are you willing to come on this journey with us? We're really excited. It's gonna take a lot of work, but if you're ready, we're ready. So it's your channel. Thanks, Liz. Uh, great presentation. So nice to see you. Um, and um, look, it's just so exciting to be on this journey um, with you. Um, we know that uh, implementing channel is going to make a lot of difference to our workforce. So maybe a few questions. We've got the chat line open. So if anybody who's currently listening wants to ask some questions, please jump on and let us know. Um, but um, I've got a couple of questions to kick off, um, of course, Liz. So look, I think one of the key questions we're gonna be faced by a lot of, um, of staff is, how do you protect my anonymity? How do I know? How, how can I be reassured? Absolutely. Kia ora, everyone. Um, yes, so um, anonymity is a massive, massive issue, and that came up time and time again uh, with all of the studies that we've done and with all of our current um, customers. And so we take that as our top priority, and um, we've got um, many checks in place to make sure that everything is anonymous. So uh, we are that safe third party 
Um, and so everything that is put into the app is kept fully anonymous by um, different databases. So for instance, you'll be asked to put in your cell phone number, but that's kept in a separate database to all your other mental health data. So there's no way that those two could be linked. In fact, at Channel, we don't even know who you are. And so um, there's no way that we could accidentally share your identity with anyone because we can't possibly do that. Um, and the other thing is, is that when we do um, send through reports, um, so the themes of what's going on for you, uh, we make sure that that's completely redacted. So if there's any information about locations, any names mentioned, or if you actually just put a lot of detail in, um, you know, sometimes, you know, we had one saying um, my wedding was cancelled because of COVID-19. Now, you might be able to know who that person whose wedding was cancelled. Um, and so we would remove that and we just say personal disruption due to COVID-19. So, um, yeah, we try and keep it absolutely um, confidential and safe for you. I'm not sure if David's still here. I've just lost David. Hello. Everyone, uh, you have to love technology. So I'm always here in the background just for occasions like this. So I'll take over. Liz, we actually have a, a question in, from chat from Matt. He's asking if the app is transferable to other emergency services like fire, police, and everyone else. Um, I know the answer, but you want to take over? And I see David's back, so I'll jump back up. Sorry, guys. Thanks for that. I just had a momentary power cut. Just went off for a second, but I'm back. So sorry, Liz. Um, no worries. Yeah, great answer. I think one of the things that I'm really interested in is um, your approach to onboarding and how we get individuals uh, to join it because it's not a, a traditional approach to joining an app. We, you've taken quite a different um, approach. So I'm really keen to hear about that. Yeah, sure. So we actually started at St. John this week um, and it's been great. So, um, you know, as you just said in the first question, anonymity is such a big issue. Um, people want to know who's behind the app. People want to know um, why its existence and all that kind of thing. And so what we do is we actually um, have channel champions. And so those are people that we've trained up um, and they, they know all about us. They know how we work and what they are doing is they're going around uh, to the hospitals, uh, to the ED departments, because sometimes you might have a couple of minutes when you hand over your patients to the hospital, when you're writing up your notes, uh, to take a minute, um, and that's when a channel champion might say, hey, did you know that there's an app out there? Um, let me tell you about it, and this is how you can download and start using it. Um, so I think that in-person approach is really important. Um, I know it's technology, and um, technology sometimes um, it feels like it's faceless, but at Channel, we really want you guys to know who we are behind it and why we do what we do. That's really cool. And I think it's going to make a huge difference um, in relation to the, the number of uh, uh, individuals who jump on board Channel, so thanks. Um, obviously, there's a lot that happens behind the app, Liz. Yes. Tell us a little bit about um, you know, your team, the support, um, etc. Sure. Um, so we've got a whole data science team um, behind um, Channel, and we've got a whole team of developers who make sure that the app is um, available 24/7 all the time. Um, you know, with healthcare, we're we're always on, so therefore your your mental health support needs to always be on as well. Um, and so the data science team um, have these machine learning, some algorithms that run through um, and are able to pick up things. So we do have red flag um, alerts. So I think somebody in the question asked about immediate help. So we do. So if you are journaling something um, and it might be around having suicidal thoughts or it might have um, you know, some concerning content, um, we've got this um, natural language processing and, and AI that runs through and it detects that and it immediately sends you a notification saying, hey, we're a little bit concerned about some of the things that you're talking about right now. Would you like to get some help? Um, when we connect in New Zealand, we connect to the 1737 helpline, which is run through the Ministry of Health, or um, we also um, refer to the organisations already. So, for instance, St John, I've got a psychologist, um, which is amazing. So we work really closely with them in providing support for people who really need it. Um, and then we've also got those other things that people can do for their self-help as well. Great. Um, we've got a question online from Matt, who's asking us, um, is 
the app transferable to other emergency services? Ah, yes, absolutely. Uh, we're very specific for healthcare. So um, we, we've we developed it mostly for hospitals and uh, for frontline healthcare workers such as paramedics, EMTs, etc. cetera. Um, but um, we are also working in our retail and some service stations um, and all sorts of different places. So definitely transferable, especially to other emergency workers. Um, I think they'd be similar with this, like the hierarchy about how we work and also responding to um, acute distress. Um, so, you know, it's not normal, I don't think, um, many other professions deal with um, death and dying and trauma as much as we do. So we have a specific emphasis on that. Great, thanks, um, Liz. Um, one of the questions we often face when we you know, meet with our mental health committee, et cetera, is how do we ensure that the information that our organization provides, as in contact details and resources, how do we how, how do we keep them up to date? But how do we make sure our staff can access them, particularly at two in the morning? The last thing you want to do is to Google your organization's website, find the right page, and click through. How yeah. does how does Channel help in that space? Yeah. So I don't know if you saw on that one of those screens was around the boosters. Um, don't ask me why it's called boosters. It's just the name that came up and it's stuck. Um, so boosters is anything that will improve your mental well-being, and so these are resources that we found that's um, evidence-based. Uh, there's a lot of woo out there, so we make sure that everything that we are putting into our boosters are based on current evidence, um, and so there might be helpful things. So for instance, there is some mindfulness. Um, there might be some um, some workshops that your organisation is already running that you can go to. So um, there's a whole range of things in those in those boosters, and because you know we know when it comes to mental health that one size doesn't fit all. Um, so it's a bit of a it's a smorgasbord. It's a range of different things that people can access, um, and it's just through one 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 touch um, of your phone, and you can go through into those resources. You don't have to go through your intranet. That's very cool. It's going to really address one of the big issues I think staff have always had. I've got another question. Um, uh, from the audience, Liz. Um, the question is, what impact has there been in ambulance service? And I'm guessing that's a little bit early for you to answer that one, but perhaps you can share the impact that you've seen from um, DHB, emergency departments, and other, and you, and I know Zed has been particularly interesting as well as an organization. Yeah, yeah, actually interesting, though, you can bring up Zed. Um, so they actually ended up in the paper with one of the things that came through, which was um, that during level four lockdown, um, where people were coughing on money before giving it to uh, the, the petrol station uh, workers and that was causing a significant um, mental health impact on workers because they were putting their lives at risk um, with people potentially bringing COVID. So um, yeah, it was being able to respond to those things really quickly, uh, which was really great. Um, some other, other changes that we've seen, especially in our emergency departments, was around the fact that they didn't have enough PPE during um, during COVID-19, and so we were able to respond really quickly uh, and get um, management to make sure that there was enough PPE for everybody available. Um, we also found actually during the first week of lockdown, people weren't sleeping, um, you know, just with high anxiety about what was happening, like the hospitals were going into full pandemic planning, like what if we got 500 patients tomorrow? Um, kind of scenarios and so it's no wonder they weren't sleeping. So what we were able to do was we were able to go in and do some workshops around um, sleep hygiene and around um, making sure that people were making sure that they were getting an adequate sleep um, so they were able to respond to the challenges at work the next day. That's really great and if someone is in immediate, needs immediate assistance Liz? Yeah so there's a send help button in the app and as soon as you click that it sends a text message to the helpline, so in Australia it will be Beyond Blue, in New Zealand it's 1737 uh, run by Home Care Medical and you will get a phone call from a counsellor back within 20 minutes. Um, and also there's always the 111 that you can call um, as most people know if you are in a um, mental health crisis as well. Cool, thanks for that. Um, the chat bot's coming which is great. Uh, what else is in your uh, on your roadmap? for innovation, Liz? Yes, so much, it's so exciting. Um, without letting the cat out of the bag, um, it's um, something that we're working with with Harvard University and with um, the University of Texas in, in um, America. So really exciting, there's some really high tech stuff coming through and it's really around giving you the ability to um, understand what's going on for you and what makes you tick. 
Um, so we all know that we're quite different. We're all individuals and we've all got unique circumstances. And being able to understand ourselves is actually really important. So um, that's that's an area that we're really looking forward to pressing into in the next next year or so. Hmm. Got another question, Liz, uh, from Dion. And it's really around... Um, you know, the potential for, an, I guess, a negative impact of um, on your employment in seeking help. And what is a risk to that? And obviously seeking help um, can be, a, I guess, a barrier to future um, a promotion as well. Yeah, absolutely. I know some organizations, you have to put your name down before you can even access um, EAP or MAP um, support. And we think that that's crazy. Um, you should be able to have at least um, three or four sessions without having to um, identify yourself. And in fact, I feel like you shouldn't have to identify yourself at all. It's a free counselling for staff. So um, we are really, really going to be championing being able to um, access counselling um, anonymously and um, being able to verify yourself that you are an employee and you deserve this um, rather than having to give your name uh, so that people are kept safe. Thanks, Liz. And um, obviously, uh, we've kicked off in New Zealand, which is great. Um, how's that rollout going? Yeah, really good. Really good. I myself have been standing in EDs and um, talking to uh, the ambulances as they come through. And yeah, it's it's been really, really great to hear people's stories. And again, it's the, it's hearing the mix of yes, I went to a really difficult pediatric situation, and I'm really quite concerned about my mental health as a result. Um, and then also there's the other flip side, which is, I, I, you know, registration's coming in for paramedics. I'm not sure how that's going to work. Um, there's a lot of changes going on. Um, I'd really like to talk to someone about that. So, you know, it's not just what you think of, you know, going to traumas and things like that. Um, it's actually other things that affect your mental health as well. Yeah. Great, thanks. So uh, um, I'm guessing Wellington Free Ambulance is next on the list for the rollout, and then we're going to head across the ditch um, and start the rollout on the uh, with the three ambulance services that have signed up um, in Australia. Do you want to tell us about that plan a little bit? Yes, absolutely. But my laptop's about to die, so I'm just going to plug it in. Hang on. Don't want to lose me again. Yeah. Okay, there we go. I had it plugged in, but not switched on. Um, yeah, so the rollout, um, really, really exciting. Um, so what we do is it takes quite a while to do a rollout because we want to make sure we do it properly and that everybody understands what we're doing and that we've got the right policies in place from the organisations to ensure that if there is, um, say, um, incidences of bullying that comes through, that we actually know how to deal with them with each particular HR um, and a health and safety as well. So um, what you might be seeing coming through will be um, some channel champions um, training. So if anyone on this call would like to be a channel champion, would like to come and get some get some um, major education around mental health 101 and things like that, and hearing a bit more what we do at channel, uh, we'd love to hear from you. So feel free to contact us at hello at channel .app. Um And um, yeah, so that's, that's that next step. And then we'll be rolling out. I think first of all, we're going with South Australia, that right, and then across to St. John uh, in Western Australia and then Tasmania. Great. You talked a little bit about um, boosters in the presentation, Liz. Do you want to give us some kind of examples of what they actually look like in reality? Yeah, sure. So one of the best boosters that we found has been peer support. Um, so I think a lot of member organisations already have peer support in place. Um, but sometimes it's quite hard to know how to access it. You have to go onto the internet, uh, things like that. So what we do is we streamline, streamline the peer support um, so that you can book in um, to see a peer supporter and then also evaluate um, and see how that, that um, helped you and give some feedback about that experience as well. Yeah. Very cool. Um, obviously, um, nutrition and exercise play a key role. How do you link up those other aspects of someone's mental health and well-being through the channel app? Yeah, sure. So we work with the themes that come through. So if there is a theme with people saying um, that they're unable to, to eat healthy because of shift work, um, because of you know not being able to um, access healthy options um, during, during shifts, um, then we'll work with the organisation and say, hey, this is a theme that's coming through. How about we um, send out some information about how to eat healthy during shift work? Um, and so, yeah, it's 
we really rely on what you guys are telling us in the app to be able to know what to design. So it's really important that you are completely honest and let us know what's going on, um, and then we can design things around it. And if you've got a great idea, feel free to send that through the journal as well, and we can feed that back on your behalf. Great, thank you. Yeah, you know, some of the services we're going to be rolling the app out into Liz are really big. You know, literally, you know, five, six thousand employees at a time. That's obviously a massive rollout. But interestingly, obviously, um, there are areas within any organisation that are perhaps mentally, the mental health and well-being is greater than others. How do you differentiate rather than you know, for example? treat a whole organization um, with a single approach? Um, so can you just rephrase that question? I think? Yeah. yeah, sorry, Liz. So I'm just thinking about, um, you know, one region might be fantastic at looking after their staff, mental health and well-being, and another region has got a lot to develop. Yep. Uh, how do we differentiate and how do we support those areas that need it the most? Yeah, sure. So what is, that's actually really great. Um, because, like, for instance, we've got um, three or four different ICUs who are currently using um, Channel across different hospitals. And so we can see that there's one ICU that's doing these really cool things and their well-being is really quite high. And we can see some other um, ICUs that aren't doing so well. So what we've been able to do is to get those senior leaders to say, hey, how about you have a chat with these guys um, and see what they're doing and learn from each other. And so um, that's been able to share that knowledge. And um, it's not about you know, compare, comparing each other and saying, you know, what's going on, but it's more about actually these guys are doing something different. What can we learn from them? Um, and also just realizing that it's, it's going to take all of us to play our part. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, as you said, it's going to be a big deal trying to onboard um, a large a number of people. But, um, yeah, we, we're really excited and um, we've got a great plan in place to be able to do that. Mm. I guess we, we've talked a lot about frontline staff, Liz. Obviously, this app is going to be made available to all staff within an organisation. And we know, you know, particularly the uh, communication centre staff um, are exposed to as much um, stress and trauma as our frontline staff. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about um, how, how we involve, you know, the wider organisation? Yeah, sure. Um, yes, and of and course, um, office staff as well, um, you know, everybody um, has a part to pay in this as well. And it's really important that we do get all aspects um, covered as well and when we do our reporting for the organisation. Um, and so, yeah, it's, 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 it's going to be a bit harder to, to get um, in front of people to be able to discuss um, about channel. But these webinars and um, technology, which is great to be able to share some of this information far and wide, um, is, is going to be really useful. So, um, yeah, we're really, really keen to, to work with uh, CAA and uh, with the organisations about getting this um, out for everybody. Awesome. You know, we celebrate some special days throughout the year, um, ranging from, um, obviously, Hand Hygiene Day to um, Restart a Heart Day and Mental Health Awareness Week, or 1010, as it um, for us. How do we... Uh, can Channel be a vehicle to uh, remind people of these special occasions? Yeah, absolutely. So um, there's something called push notifications that the app sends out, and so it just pops up on your phone. Um, and so organisations can send through um, push notifications. So, um, for instance, if you had a Restart a Heart Day, you'd be able to send that through and say, hey, today's Restart a Heart Day. This is some things you can do to learn about CPR, to learn about new resuscitation guidelines, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so that'll just come through on your phone. So it's a really great communication tool. Uh, we call it closing the loop. Um, and it's also a good place for people to be able to say, you know, it's pink shirt day. Uh, let's all wear pink shirts today and, um, and point people to resources that way as well. Great. There's a lot of apps out in the marketplace at the moment. Uh, you know, mental health and well-being is is a very um, popular area at the moment. Um, what what is different about Channel? I know. I, I believe I know what's different, but you know, but keen for you to share that with our audience because you know the CA we we looked at dozens of apps. And we landed on this one. I'm just keen for you to share, in your opinion, what's what's the uh, differentiating point. 
Yeah, I think um, it's by the people for the people. Um, we we understand what kind of things that you guys go through. Uh, we're mostly health professional based ourselves, and so um, can can understand the environment that you're working in is so so unique. Um, and also, yeah, I think um, closing that loop, just as we said, um, being able to get the organisation to be involved as well and change some of those systemic changes um, is really important. Like for me and my personal story, like this guy was a non-bully. He had like destroyed many people's lives before mine. And it wasn't until I actually spoke up to him and said, I'm really, really suffering under your uh, bad behaviour, um, that he realised and was able to get help himself. And now he's changed, and now students really love being with him. So, um, yeah, I think it's 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 about being able to close that loop and to get changes to be happening. Great. And if, for example, I'm already subscribing to another mental health app, yeah, is it complimentary. Yeah, absolutely is. Yeah, excellent. We a number of our services um, have already looked at other apps, so um, we're we're really, really excited to see um, how channel is you know uh, integrated into their current systems um my, my belief is that it's going to be like a central cog that pulls a whole lot of existing information together brings it to one place on an individual smartphone so that um, accessibility is is really made available so that's really exciting um liz uh, my last question really to you before we finish up today is um you know, this has been exciting for us and for you, I'm sure. Um, you know, what, what, what has been your proudest moment, really, in, in getting to where you have got to today and launching Channel? Um, it's been a lot of moments. That's a big question, David. But I actually, I think just on Friday, actually, I was um, at one of these hospitals talking to ambulance providers, and um, there was a 50-year-old a um paramedic who broke down in tears and said somebody is actually caring about us and um yeah i tried to hold back tears myself um listening to that so i think um it has been tough out there covid especially has been really really tough and um if we can do anything at all to help people um to you know to get support then i think this is why we do what we do and this is why we get out of bed and this is why I stopped working in the hospital as a trainee in psychiatry um, to be able to get as much help out there as we possibly can right now. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think we don't fully understand the impacts of COVID um, on staff yet. I think we're still kind of fighting the battle um, on all fronts and uh, a lot of those impacts won't be felt. So it's really timely that we're able to launch Channel now um, because we're start collecting some data, we'll start uh, pushing out some help uh, for people before they you know, reach a tipping point, hopefully. Excellent. So we're just about um, out of time. Was there anything else, Liz, you wanted to add? No, but thank you very much for your questions. And if anybody's got any more questions that they'd like to ask me, um, feel free to email me um, or to um, contact um, CAA to get in contact with me. Um, and yeah, really happy to talk further about anything. If you've got ideas for what you would like to be in the app as well, we're very, very keen to hear um, things that you would like to support your mental health. Um, so yeah, very, very keen to, to, to work with you. That's great, Liz. And again, you know, thank you for your time. Um, it just shows the level of commitment that you've got to the program. And, and I just want to say again, that we're really excited to be on this journey with you. Really excited to see um, the first and of many ambulance services, hopefully uh, rolling out the app. And excited, you know, in a year's time, we'll be able to look back and say, wow, it did really make a difference. And, um, and I, you know, my, my, I guess, hope is that um, Australia and New Zealand again set the benchmark for ambulance services around the world in relation to working together in this space. So awesome. Right, I'm going to hand back to our administrator now um, to fight, finish off um, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you for attending the CAA 2020 Explore webinar on mental health and well-being with Dr. Liz Berryman. Join us for our next webinar on Tuesday the 24th of November for Women in Leadership with Michelle Fife. 
and keep up to date by following us on Twitter at the Council of AM1 or on LinkedIn and Facebook, the Council of Ambulance Authorities Australasia. We look forward to seeing you next time.